Uh, very graciously, graciously agreed to give us uh, speeches to close it out. And then after that, we're going to have the results announcement. Uh, as Fanli has um, indicated before, we will have three teams receiving awards of about 5,500 and four teams receiving about 3K uh, after uh, our final tonight. Um, so we were just notified uh, that there were some issues with the remote um, technical um, Dallas. So I'm going to hold off on introducing the opening keynote speaker until that is resolved. So we apologize for technical difficulties. This is, you know, the Zoom times that we're currently in. So um, yeah, sit tight. We'll uh, resume momentarily. Thank you. And in the meantime, uh, we have some gifts for the people, uh, the audiences that are here in person. So if my staff could please help hand out the, the gifts that are here while we're waiting, that would be awesome. Yeah, thank you for everybody who com comes in today. And we've prepared some gifts, some teddy bears wearing Harvard or MIT sweaters or t-shirts, hoodies. So if you like one, please come into the front. <laughs> All right, actually, we were uh, given a green light that a voice is on for remote audiences. So we're going to resume very shortly, I guess, indeed. So for the opening keynote, it's my pleasure to introduce Reg Zhang from Sequoia Capital, China. He is a partner and he's been focused on early stage investing, um, focused on very early tech. Um, and he has multiple experiences and, you know, very successful uh, investments. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, let me hand it to our remote participants and um, uh, the Zoom webinar. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Hello,大家好,我是张涵 其实这方面创业者应该关心的东西其实蛮多的那最早最重要的是什么呢我觉得其实从大的方向来讲其实就是timing到 到二十年大的这个平台型的这个互联网创业这个机会过去之后，实际上我们可以看到，其实呃基于信息科技的这个啊基基于IT技术的演进，还有包括人工智能等一系列啊平台型技术的改演进。那在交叉方面，交叉科
因为有这些技术迭代而产生。比如说我们之前啊，几年我们从到从到现在我们都比较关注，比如说包括 Metaverse 啊，包括这个 AR VR， 还有自动驾驶等等一系列的，还有包括啊医疗健康。啊，生物等等方向都有非常大的一些进展，所以我们从我们的感觉来说，实际上科技在进一步的不断深化的改变我们的生活。所以呢，实际上啊，从科技创业的角度来说，我觉得二零二二依然是一个非常好的机会。另外呢，如果如果这个公司会有啊中国的 China angle 的话，那其实中国市场因为它有一个非常强强劲的国产化替代的一个机会。然后，并且整个这个呃国内的这个创新的氛围是非常好的，所以呢，实际上在这个这个环境下，依然有非常好的一个机会去把一个啊、呃、初创团队的产品和理念方向，在比如说中国市场去实践起来。那中国市场的实践也可能会带动一个未来潜在的一个全球的一个市场的机会。所以我们认为，实际上在科技创业这块。啊，是有非常好的一个 China angle 的。那另外一个呢，呃，最近大家可能也关注到这个二级市场整体这个科技科技二级呃科技股的表现并不好。那这个从做现在这个时间点来创业来说，实际上我们一直认为早期的公司，尤其是优秀的早期公司，能够穿越这个经济周期，能够穿越这种金融上的一些波动。那原因是这个。啊，我们早期的这个科技公司，我们瞄准的可能是下一个时代的一个未来开启的新兴市场，或者是一个这个增量市场。那在早期刚初创的时候，实际上你正是 build up 你的这个啊产品技术市场的这么一个时间。所以啊，当这个东西这当这部分你找到了下一个时代刚需的时候，和你的最早的这个客户去打磨这些东西的时候，实际上。在这个啊，你你有可能啊，还是能够在这个早期拿到足够多的这个 VC 或者是其他的这个资本上的支持。那那在这种情况下，实际上你还是有能力创业周期的。当时当然啊，对于融资的能力来说，实际上在这样的一个周期里头，相对低谷里边可能会啊变得难度有有所增加。但是，一旦啊我们的创业公司拿到钱的话，可能。啊，你的竞争竞争力也都能体现出来了，因为市场上可能呃和你竞争的竞争对手，尤其是其他的 startup， 它可能啊融资能力没你强，然后竞争力也执行力也没有你团队强，所以在这个时候实际上并不是一个呃红海的市场。那这个时候如果你切入的是一个未来的刚需点，然后呢又有一定的一个增量机会，那其实。啊，创业周期反而可能对于啊优秀的早期公司来说是个很好的一个机会，啊，所以在这个时间点，我我我认为它是一个可能啊真真正应该好好考虑是不是应该进来创业的一个很好的时间点。从我们投资人的角度来说，这个初创公司应该关心什么呢？实际上。啊、呃，也没有太多的新鲜东西啊。大家可以看到我，我我这个这个图里头放的东西里头，三个颜色不一样的。那其实啊、呃，换换换换句换句话说，就是啊、呃，找人、找找方向、找钱。那、呃、这个三个不一样的部分，因为这三部分可能是这个整个公司最重要的一个早期初创时候的组成部分。首先，你要有足够强大的一个合伙人团队，然后另外呢。啊、呃，你要有一个足够好的 idea， 但是这两个实际上是结合的，因为实际上一个早的创早期创业公司在组建的时候，你你可能从投资人角度希望是一个完美团队，或者说一个比较全面的团队，然后呢有一个非常好的一个创业方向。那这个创业方向呢，这个要和这个呃团队的能力是相互匹配的，所以在这个过程中，实际上。啊、呃，也是啊、呃，早期最重要的一个一个一个，就初初创期最重要的两个因素。那在当这两个因素相对来说是比较这个完善了之后，实际上融资和股东啊、呃，自然而然可能就会会会会会成型，你就会找到你可能想要的股东，然后也拿到你可以拿到的钱。那在这个
这位置呢，实际上是蛮重要的，因为好的早期的股东可能是陪伴你创业时间最长的那个机构投资人。那在这个样的机构投资人，你去选择他的时候，实际上你要你就要去看是不是这样的这个真正做到你董事会里的这个投资人，能够和你啊一起去探讨未来的这个方向，还有这个啊能够帮你去这个建呃这个在早期呃初创的时候帮你一块排除排查很多你有可能踩的坑。那这个这块的话，我觉得实际上，呃，好的投资人能够给到团队非常好的支持。那其他的部分呢，大家可以看到，团队建设呀、产品研发这个这些，虽然列在有可能实际项，但实际上根据大家业务方向不同，可能还有很多不其他的模块都是要去关注的。但是呢，从我我我们。呃，做这个呃创业投资这么很多年以来，我们观察到，实际上呃本质上来说，呃创业实际上是一个聚人的过程，所以其实最重要的还是人的因素。那这个聚人的概念，实际上就是说，从你一个人有这个 idea 开始，然后你要影响到你的这个合伙人，然后来加入到你，然后影响到你的股东投资人来加入到你，然后呢，这个。影响到你的、你的、你的整呃团队，团队之后是你的产品，产品其实就对应的是你的用户和你的客户，那包括市场、你的合作伙伴，未来新的这个投资人、券商，包括你的新的这个，包括 IPO 之后的股东，所以整个公司实际上是从一变成几百人、上千人的这个过程的，而且你辐射的业务可能是从非常小的范围内。变成越来越大的这个一个很大的市场生态都是由你来建立的，所以整个这个过程实际上都是巨人。所以我觉得从 CEO 的角度来说，啊，巨人的能力应该是所有的核心能力最重要的之一了。所以我觉得就是在早期的时候，在初创公司的时候，实际上啊 ，CEO 和整个这个核心团队去把这个整个我们把这生态建立起来的整个巨人的这个大的逻辑梳理清楚。那那那把这个啊，包括钱和事情都安排的比较有有有有条理，那那那我们成功的概率就会变得更高。讲几个我们在这个红杉种子基金呃成立以来，就是支持过的这个呃有留学背景的这个 CEO 的故事吧。然后呃有一个这几个公司呢，都是目前我们。准准独角兽公司啦，就是发展非常迅速，非常快，啊，我们也是想告诉大家，实际上在早期有一个好投资人是非常重要的。这个 Matis 这公司呢，实际上最早呢是呃基于这个 AI 计算和高通量实验来进行这个制剂优化和制剂新药开发的这么一个公司，但通过我们长期跟他的这个沟通交流，然后包他梳理这个。啊，方向我们实际上，因为它的技术相关性，我们其实帮他一起找到了做这个 mRNA 的这个递送的这个新的更更有前景的一个方向，作为他公司的另一大的主营业务方向。所以在这个、这个过程中，实际上啊，也是互相受益的一个过程。然后呢，公司发展也非常非常好。然后同时，我们也给他们介绍了这个比较大的公司，跟他们进行合作。所以，就是从持续支持的角度来说，而且这个公司的最早也是我们呃投过的一家公司，从里面就孵化的一个项目。所以整体来说，我们对这个公司的帮助是非常大的，而且这个公司的发展是啊、呃、非常非常好的。另外呢，就是我们和呃其他很多投资人一块都投过这个 New X 这个这个这个陈航这个同投呃这个对吧？咱们 I M I T 的这个校友。那这个他也是我们给他们这个公司在啊、呃，其实是远程就做进行了投资，没有任何的没有见面，因为在疫情表最严重的时候，我们因为啊、呃、对这方面的知识储备和对他们的方向非常的看好，所以远程就做了投资。然后之后呢，我们又帮他们去找了 CXO 级别的这个合伙人。另外一个非常好的这个例子就是我们的这个台积图形的这个创始人胡延明啊，腰杆出身，然后呢跟他的故事就更多了。前前后后我们的投资人和他沟通关于创业的事情花了一年多的时间，然后在这个过程中，实际上
呃，帮他一块去想这个到底怎么去去创业的 angle 是什么。然后呢，在在他决定创业之后，我们不但是说投资了他，而且帮他整个搬回中国，呃，这个还有这个帮他去梳理他的商业化方向，因为他原来做的是面向社区的这个呃编程语言。那我们帮他去看，哎，如果你要想做变成一个商业公司的话，可能光有社区不行，你要有足够强的商业，呃，商业产品。所以我们在这块都给了他非常大的一个支持和帮助，包括对于啊、呃、这些商业化思路上的一些帮助，以及这个找呃帮他去找这个相应的团队。所以我们这个红杉种基金，其实我们主要倡导的就是投早投小。科技主导，然后并且办公益，啊、呃，我们一八年成立以来到现在，实际上整体管理规模是五十亿人民币，已经投资了将近三百个公司。那这个这四年来接触了超过一万六千个这个创业者，啊，然后呢，各种科技行业我们全部都覆盖，大家都可以看到，包括半导体啊、新能源、双碳、EV 啊、呃、这个制药呃 AI 制药啊等等一系列比较。啊，新的这个科技方向我们都有有涉足。另外呢，我们在项目里面有达到百分之七十创始人是呃这个和公司，我们是第一轮作为最早的机构投资人进入。所以作为因为红杉，我们的整体理念非常重要一个就是作为创业者背后的创业者，因为我们的创创业状态也是啊、呃、这个非常足的，所以和。愿意和这个创业者长期这个共同成长，所以我们实际上在目前运运用了这个行业效率最高的决策机制，然后我们有四个孵化器，先入驻了几十家公司，然后帮助我们的被投企业呃招了这个五千家的这个人才，所以这个我们希望呃能够支持到更多更优秀的这个创业者。如果是这个，尤其今天我们在这个美东的这个会，我们希望更多的美东的咱们优秀的人才都能够去呃创业，然后我们也能支持到啊。谢谢大家，我今天就先先跟大家抛砖引玉说这么多。Thank you, Reggie. Thank you very much for your presentation,、uh, going over the Sequoia approach.、Um, next up, we'll begin the pitches.、Um, but before we do that, I would like to introduce our judges who are online、uh, this evening.、Um, let me share my screen. All right. So joining us tonight as judges are,、um, firstly, Yong Tong Wen Wen Yong Tong、uh, from Baidu Ventures, who is a VP currently at Baidu.、Uh, he focuses on AIGC, AR VR, Web three,、uh, and he has a deep portfolio of、uh, companies in that area. We also have Shuo Huang,、uh, who's also from Baidu Ventures, who also graduated from our very own Cambridge area,、uh, postdoc at Harvard University. Uh, she is currently in charge of the、uh, North America projects、uh, for Baidu Ventures, and especially in the biotech area. And last but not least, we have Tina Kuang, who is from Gen Fund,、uh, and also leading Gen Fund's North America、um, projects. She graduated from Georgetown University and joined Gen Fund in 2016.、Um, so all three of them are online.、Um, And、uh, without further ado, I'll hand it off to our first presenter,、uh, our first team competing tonight.、Um, of bio. I just want to make sure that the online audiences can also see the pitch deck.
Okay. Thank you, everyone. Hi, my name is Krishna, and today I'm going to talk about UpBio and how we are trying to develop the OS of biomanufacturing. As an executive summary for those of you who don't want to listen to the whole pitch, uh, we, are an, uh, we are a deep tech company trying to make biomanufacturing easier for the next generation of biotech companies. Uh, the overall market is around $8.5 billion just in the algorithms and the new tech for accelerating bio, uh, biomanufacturing. But we are also trying to focus our programs towards like bioremediation, which is a three, $340 billion industry worldwide. We are ready to launch our MVP mid-summer. The technology development uh, phase and the de-risking for our first product is complete at this point. And we have a multidisciplinary team to actually launch this product and scale it up. We are looking for about 400,000 in uh, pre-seed funding just so that we can get this product out and start capturing a large chunk of the market. So for those of you who don't know what biomanufacturing is, at UP, we think of like microbes as living factories. So since the dawn of time, people have been uh, taking bacteria and microbes and creating all kinds of food products from them and all kinds of crazy things, right? Like, and for a huge chunk of the audience here who's from China, you know for a fact that a lot of Asian cultures have a lot of fermented foods. So we've been doing this since the dawn of time. But now with the power of biotechnology and genetic engineering tools, we're able to do this at larger scales and we're able to like create custom molecules and replace how we think about manufacturing in general with something like this. And so when I say manufacturing, it's everything ranging from like industrial chemicals, engineered foods, agricultural products, whether it's fertilizers, additives, whatnot, and even construction materials like concrete and everything. So we are not the only people saying that we're gonna do this. There are about hundreds of companies out there that have huge markets and are, are making great strides. But the thing is that, and because there's so many companies just Developing new tech to accelerate this biomanufacturing R&D research is about an $8.5 billion industry with a 14% CAGR. And the reason this is great and there'll be more and more companies is because we estimate around like a $4 trillion total market opportunity in the next 50 years. And that is a lot of money. Now, the thing with biomanufacturing is that biology is hard. And so when we thought about like what it actually takes, right? Like at UP, we thought about how can we help people do this better and faster. We looked at the entire process. You go from like the idea, like let's say you wanna make a particular molecule X. First, what you do is you try figuring out how to do a, like a, how to manufacture that in small quantities. So you kind of do like a pilot run. And then once you know you're able to make enough of it, you do all the debugging for that you end up doing a scaling up process where you're continuously improving the yields. And that's what most companies do today. Now, the thing is that this first process is completely manual, which means that if you have an idea saying that you want to make molecule Y from molecule X, it takes anywhere ranging from like a couple of weeks to a couple of months to actually do this. And if you have any errors, you need to go back to the drawing board and God forbid you miss out something in the entire manufacturing and post-processing step in the scale up, you need to come back to the drawing board and do this all over again. Now, the thing is that because of this, making a, taking a new product to market can take anywhere between 50 to $100 million, ranging from like six to eight years. Now, the thing is a lot of us people, startups and maybe other biomanufacturing startups, each one of these errors are super, super expensive. It means that with a single one of these errors, if it's badly timed, the entire company can go kaput. That means that you know they run out of money, they run out of runway, and this entire venture is useless because nobody, they don't have any more money left. So that is exactly why what we are trying to do at UP is to build this biomanufacturing OS. So we are not only talking about building software, but we want to build hardware pro we want to build hardware automation assays and also biological libraries that make it easy for all kinds of companies to do biomanufacturing R and D. What we are thinking of is making sure that you know the next generation of people who are solving big problems like glo uh, global warming, climate change, and everything have like a ramp to really start off quickly. So in order to do this, what we are basically saying. As our first product, we're take, building like a biochemistry discovery as a service product. So this is like something like a search engine where you can open up on your browser and start looking for pathways to make your molecules of interest. And so by using this, we 
we can basically take what would take like three months and three scientists with no guarantees into a consume into a process that would take less than one week based on how wide your constraints are search constraints are and by doing this which means that you know like if you are an early stage company trying to figure out what you is this a product you want to make or is this another pivot you want to do you don't spend a lot of time you can within a week completely without anybody's interference this will get done on the site and they can actually figure out how to build a business better now the tech, now the way this kind of works is uh, you know as a computer scientist i find this kind of like naive but we take whatever user inputs are coming in and what we do in the computer science world is we create what we call a constraint problem so we take the user query and we mine a data from like public and private databases and we constrain this computer science problem called like a constraint solving problem and by solving this constraint solving problem we find uh, new biochemical pathways which will help enable manufacture bio manufacturing from there what we do is we run a bunch of machine learning algorithms to optimize for specific as, uh, chassis as in specific organisms and from there we can generate like what are the actual constructs you need to insert into the genome of these organisms to make them manufacture these uh, uh, chemicals now the thing what we also do is that we also optimize for like the post processing steps which means that once you build it at scale you need to separate these molecules right now these are areas where a lot of companies fail and there's some big companies which have failed in this step so we try to optimize for these uh, those kinds of stages where you need to do conventional chemistry processes and we also try to optimize for specific organisms and because of the way we do it is not a machine learning first approach it's like a more like a constraint solving approach and then we optimize for much uh, different organisms we can basically develop our libraries to work against multiple things and we can optimize for specific areas now the thing is that this most of this technology has been de-risked and has been developed over the last few years at sandia national lab with uh, funding from the department of energy and we're currently licensing uh, stuff from them in terms of our strategy like up as i mentioned up is not only like a software development company we think of our search engine as a go to market strategy where we start collecting data and algorithms which are necessary for helping accelerate other people's r and d and over that phase by figuring out what are the uh, most common assays which are necessary to be automated we want to build out the hardware stack for making a cloud based optimized optimization and automation solution and finally, utilizing this entire both software and hardware infrastructure, we want to start developing libraries, which will make it a lot more easier to create new kinds of re uh, chemical reaction pathways. Uh, because of the way our search engine works, we believe we are able to like explore more complex engineering uh, paradigms, which are conventionally not taken up by any biologists. Now, right now, uh, the way people do this in industry, the de facto standard is that you have a bunch of scientists read papers. Now, the thing, uh, alternatively, we can, uh, they can try getting some open source packages, but that requires them to have like a whole team to get it set up. And they need, they can go to consultants, but they're expensive and they don't have any control. What we offer is complete control about how people want to do R&D at an atomic level. Now our team is multidisciplinary and we're lucky to have like a great stellar team of advisors advising us on how to build out this platform. And we are also happy to uh, have all the support from like the local Boston and North American startup ecosystem for helping build this out better. Uh, we are currently uh, plan to launch our MVP mid summer and we are ready to like take off very soon. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to answer anything. Thank you. Thank you, Radha Krishna. And our judges online, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself, turn on your camera, and ask any questions. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your nice introduction of your project. Uh, I just have Mm, two questions for you. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to also I'm wondering, can you uh, if you can elaborate the current competitive landscape a bit more? Yes. Uh, currently, the work done is very manual, as in people read papers, if they have folks with the skills to make metabolic models, they will do the simulations. And you know, it varies everywhere. There are some open source tools which can kind of find you pathways for doing something like this, but you know everything requires them to like actually put together their own databases, 
set up the cyber infrastructure and everything. Also, the way we kind of solve is slightly different, which makes gives them an advantage of actually pruning through result, results a lot better. And finally, the other option is like CROs. If you heard of like big companies like Ginkgo and everything, they work in the CRO format where you pay them some money, you spend a lot of time building the contract and you know, you send them something and you get, I mean, you never know what you get at the, the output. So, I mean, not to belittle the work, they are amazing scientists over there, but there is no atomic control on what you want. And that is what we want to enable startups to have. I see. So basically you mean that uh, you're focusing on the more like upstream of the entire process, like designing and uh, like uh, and upscale of the, uh, the product at the right? Uh, we want to build the tools that will help companies do this on their own, but costs a lot lesser because building these design tools is usually limited to like, if you see large biotech companies, they have entire product, uh, entire R&D teams doing this work. We want to build like a more SaaS version of it so that everybody has access to it. And it's not just limited to an Amaris or a Ginkgo or something like that. All right. So do you foresee any possible obstacles in any of your business models? Uh, yes. So one of the biggest challenges we do see is uh, convincing folks for like IP sharing. And like one advantage is even if we start working horizontally with a lot of small companies, we might have some leverage in getting negotiating better IP contracts. As in, you know, taking learnings from one company and implementing them in the others. We see potential obstacles when we work with larger companies where they might be more cagey about like sharing their data. But we still think that just working with large companies will give us enough of uh, enough of field experience to know like what are the battles we need to pick and start creating IP on our own. All right, gotcha. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. And I was wondering, so can you tell us more about the technical advancement that made uh, you know, this possible uh, for you to start this company. So in other words, what, uh, what has changed um, for you to actually do, do this at this time? Yes, definitely. So there are two factors that fall into this one. One is the thing that, you know, in order to build a search engine, it's a multi-year, multidisciplinary kind of a project. And we've been lucky enough to like be uh, like our co-founder Leanne is worked on this technology during her time at Sandia National Lab. And so this was a government funded multi lab project for like, it was a $20 million project over like multiple laboratories. And so we kind of de-risked a huge chunk, which would, which is potentially not very good in like the VC world, like de-risk. So that is one side, one advantage of it. And the other piece is because it worked in like the development of the software was built in tandem with other actual, you know, biological and wet lab research. We were uh, like Leanne was able to uh, distill like the kind of constraints and uh, the kind of constraint and optimization techniques necessary optimized for biomanufacturing. So it's uh, a confluence of good things that makes this possible, I would say. Thank you. And maybe can you tell us more about how your team meet and how you guys come up with this great idea? Yes. So our team met at an innovation studio held, uh, which was funded by the uh, Department of Energy and the National uh, NI, uh, NISA, which is the Nuclear Institute of uh, Scientific Advancement. And so essentially we were uh, put together, uh, our team was uh, kind of like formed in like an innovation studio over there where our team, uh, where we realized that, you know, everybody in our team had like mutually complementary things to actually put this product out very quickly. Uh, as you can see, our team has uh, everyone ranging from like program management to software engineering and like uh, design automation and computational biology. So that's kind of how our team kind of came through. Cool, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Abayo. Um, I think that's time and we're gonna welcome up our next team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, next up we have 3D Architect. Can you actually change the computer? Uh, 
and just plug out the thing. Okay. And we're gonna do the hybrid presentation and I just connected uh, my co-founder Hideaki. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Is there a way to... Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you be closer to the mic? Okay, okay. Can you speak up again? Can you hear me okay? Hello. Hello. I'd be freezing, sorry. Oh. Hello. You can't, you can't hear me. Okay, work. Sorry. Sorry for taking time. So my name is Kai Narita. I'm a co-founder of 3D Architect. So 3D Architect evolutionized metal manufacturing recycling process. So we use our core technology, which is gel-based 3D printing to make 3D structural metal or 3D architecting metal. By using this technology, our vision is to build a sustainable platform of metal manufacturing and recycling for every person on the planet. We are addressing three fundamental problems in a metal manufacturing, sustainability, product quality, and production. Our and steel sector is responsible for the largest CO2 emission in the industry. And there, five to 50% of metal scraps are produced during machining process to the final products. And as you may accept, expect, metal is very heavy and designless. There are vast opportunities to introduce 3D architecture design to reduce the weight and also improve product performance. Also, material section is very limited by the machinability or the brittleness of materials. And traditional manufacturing process requires huge investment costs for the furnace and also that requires large production for the benefit. So we have three solutions, three solutions here to address these problems. Sustainable 3D print, introducing 3D architecture design uh, to improve the product quality, so low cost and rapid 3D printing process. So our technology can offer the net zero carbon metal manufacturing by adopting the bio-based resin and simple recycling process. And our technology also actually offers the highest resolution in the metal manufacturing. And you can print exotic materials such as much print, 3D print. And our, in order to adapt our technology, what we need is actually just $500, the 3D printer that you can buy in Amazon. So our technology switching cost is 100 times lower than the state-of-the-art metal 3D printers. And by using the state-of-art 3D printing, you can create human-sized products just by four hours. And those solutions are enabled by our technology here, the gel-based 3D printer approach for metal manufacturing and recycling. So there are four steps in our manufacturing process. So we invented special resin that is composed of commercially available uh, chemicals, and you can do 3D print by using the commercially available LCD 3D printer to make 3D structural gel. And we simply immerse this 3D printed gel into a metal, metal precursor solution so that metal precursor can be stirred into this 3D printed gel to make metal precursor in gel. And then finally, we can convert this metal precursor into metals by simple heating process. And we can do the recycling by simply dissolving these metal scraps into acid solution to make a metal precursor solution, which is used in a step three in a manufacturing process. And you can make a variety of materials by using, this, by using this technology, including copper, silver, alloy, or different metals, and also other functional materials, such as battery materials or ceramics. And here is a competitive landscape of our technology by comparing with on the other manufacturing methods that can create 3D custom design metals. So for example, if you wanna make traditional parts that you, that you can make by other technologies, our technology offers the shortest lead time and the lowest equipment cost, and lower product costs than other rapid manufacturing process, such as 
state of our symmetry three printers or automated machining such as CNC machining. And we can go beyond that, which means we can create a product that has never been made by other technologies by taking advantage of minimum feature size and also the much material 3D print and in-house recycling. And then we'll pass to the Hideaki to talk about more the market we are targeting. Oh, can you hear me okay? I think we cannot hear your voice actually. Hello? Hello? Okay, let me, let, me, let me just take over. I think there's technical difficulty here. So you're targeting three uh, markets, the jewelry, the cement batteries, and automotive electrical steel. So we generally target jewelry market because of our high technical readiness level. And we can produce, for example, silver jewelry by 1996.5%, reduce CO2 emission and fasten custom design. We're gonna move on to the same batteries and automotive electrical steel by taking, by transforming, by translating our know-how, which is we accumulate in jewelry, jewelry market. And we did uh, the market discovery and interviews. For the jewelry market, we did uh, 30, more than 30 plus uh, jewelry designers in one interview. And we found that our initial customer segment is jewelry designers who use loss box casting with 3D CAL data. For those people, there's no switching cost for them to use our technology. What they have to do is that just pr provide 3D CAL data to us and we can provide 3D design products by one day or two days. And by using this method, we address their pain points, sustainability of our production and of our kind design which has a high resolution. And we accumulate the know-how in this process and we translate those technology to the produce electrical steel and batteries. For example, for the electrical steel, um, there's, we know that what's the ideal material for the electrical steel. However, there's manufacturing limitation by the breathlessness material. But by using our technology, 3D print technology, we can create the iron 6.5 silicon material, which is basically ideal material. And we can offer 54% efficiency improvement and 33% CO2 reduction in the manufacturing process. And also one of our the target is, a, is battery. So we have a high value chain network for the automotive material supplier of battery material manufacturers. And also one of the automotive companies contacted us to, to make a 3D printed battery. So there's a big interest about 3D printed battery here. And here's our management team, me as a co-founder, a CEO and CTO. My background is material science, I did manufacturing, I obtained a PhD at Caltech last year. And as a co-founder, Hideaki, he's a, MBA candidate at UCLA has a lot of experience in the business and the finances. And there's three advisors here for the industrial advisor. Jenny has a lot of know-how here for the 3D printed jelly. And technical advisor is Professor Julia Glear at Caltech, who is a specialist, a pioneer of additive manufacturing and nanomaterials. And legal advisor Bonso has a lot of experience in IP strategy and also corporate law. And thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey, hi, I'm Yongtun from Body Venture. Thank you for your presentation. And I have a question here. You, you uh, I, I, um, I noticed that you, you touched him for jewelry industry. So you will provide the um, 3D printing and service directly to the customer, or you just uh, uh, do the um, uh, to to be business, means you just sell the equipment or services to the uh, to the to the direct provider, um, and not to to do the uh, retail the business. This is actually really hard to hear you. Could you repeat again the the second part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, I I. I noticed that you touched him for a jewelry industry yes. um, for 3P pen, uh, printing. So you will um, provide the uh, 3D printing services direct to, to the customers. Or, or you just, so business, uh, yep. I got, I got your point. So our business with the first, yep. you're gonna manufacture in-house to provide the 3D architecture, 3D design jewelry to the designers. And once you found mm -hmm. that we have a very good popularity you know, technologies and we're gonna start licensing to other manufacturers because what they, they have already 3D printers and, and the knowledge of 3D CAL. So their switching cost is really low. What they have to do is just buying a $500 Amazon 3D printer and buying a mm -hmm. special resin. Okay, got you. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, I just have a simple question. Uh, is your tech technology can expand to other material like non-metal material? Yes. So what we can make is basically metal containing material. So it could be metal, oxide, ceramics, and variety of materials, basically. So one of the examples is battery materials, but it's not pure metal. It's more like the same cobalt oxide or something like complex metals oxides. So you can make like ceramics, body materials, other metals and alloys. But, okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. No, so first, so, so the, the point here is that we can, we want to take advantage of our high resolution 3D printing and very fast custom design process. So not like a car or a building, that's one, not our target in the beginning. That's why we choose the jewelry market, that people like, you know, the very like architecture design and also the silver market, silver is actually the easiest material we can make. So we're gonna go to the supermarket and going to the, for example, batteries that you can probably use in the phone, for example, that's the size we're gonna targeting, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, if there are no further questions, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, 3D Architect. Okay, we're going to switch it back to our laptop. And in the meantime, we're going to line up the next team. Round of applause. Thank you. Uh, so, Salim, Jack, are you guys uh, guys with me? Can we do an audio check? Yeah. Can you can you hear us, Ben? Loud and clear. Excellent. Uh, cool. So, you want to kick us off, Salim? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So, growing up, I'd always wonder why my dad was always at work. You know, he's missing family vacations. He was missing dinners. Um, but as I grew up, I started helping him at the manufacturing plant that he owned and ran. And I saw the reason was that he had to do a lot of manual verification of processes in order to keep production running smoothly. Um, and as he grew in scale, he started hiring supervisors and managers, um, but they had to do similar things, you know, with clipboards and tracking vital tasks for the plant. Um, and then this is for good reason, because if, if issues in the plant are not caught early, they snowball and they turn into downtime, which is where a lot of the real losses happen. Um, and so this is where we started as a company, you know, did, how do we ditch the clipboard and let my dad and people like him have more time to focus on what's important instead of checking off a list on a clipboard. So thank you. And Ben, you can dig it from here. Thanks, Salim. So Salim's dad was, was pretty busy uh, uh, growing up and then Salim was uh, right on the front lines with him working in his dad's factory. Um, and this, this issue that his father experienced uh, where so much of his time was taken up with direct supervisory tasks, as opposed to planning the future of the business and focusing on other things that matters. Turns out his father's not alone. 
it's very, very common for factory managers to spend more than half their time doing direct supervision instead of planning the future of their business. And so we're TriStar AI and we help eliminate downtime while, while unlocking managers from direct supervisory tasks. And we have, the, we have a perfect team to go after this problem. Uh, our team brings over a decade in automotive industry experience combined with cutting edge academic research. Uh, myself and Jack uh, are from the auto industry. I have over six years with Ford. Jack leads analytics with GM. And Salim has spent a year in the media lab and finished his master's in medical imaging at Harvard. So let's talk about the cost of downtime. In the industry that Jack and I come from automotive, just one minute of downtime can lead to more than $22,000 in extra cost. And almost a quarter of those incidents are caused by human error. So what, what's behind this human error? Well, we break it down into three categories. The first is performance. This is things like an employee not working up to the proper standards, or perhaps a task that was poorly designed so that the employee set up to fail. The next is negligence. Somebody shows up late or they forget to do an important task. And the third is safety issues. For example, an employee entering an unauthorized zone causing a shutdown of the complete facility. <clears throat> okay, so to solve this problem, we created the Loom Supervisor. The Loom Supervisor uses existing CCTV cameras throughout the plant and combines that with cutting edge computer vision to perform action classification, operator error detection, and generate process analytics. During a demo that we did in a plant in Texas, the manager told us knowing the hopper wasn't loaded right saved me a huge headache from restarting the machines. So what else can LUM do? LUM sends real-time alerts to managers, generates performance statistics, and creates advanced analysis that can be used for process optimization. LUM quantifies errors into efficiency metrics, and it automatically flags areas for improvement. And it can be used to standardize worker performance metrics across stations and departments. This market is pretty big. Uh, the people monitoring and safety uh, industry with, within manufacturing is over $5 billion and continues to grow. It's also a competitive industry, but we're very confident that our unique combination of capability plus scalability really sets us apart from our competitors in this space. So where are we headed? This summer, we'd like to run a pilot in a manufacturing plant. In the fall, we'd like to scale that pilot out to a few more facilities. And by the end of the year, we'd like to do a full product launch. The revenue model is pretty simple. It's a subscription-based service uh, on a per camera basis. And there are additional upsell opportunities uh, through our analytics platform. And so with that, oops, there we go. Happy, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question here. And uh, we noticed that the safety issues in the manufacturing industry uh, is, quite, uh, is quite important. But uh, there is a lot of uh, industries that can, you can adapt your technology. So what's the priority in industry uh, you are touching to um, adapt your te technology in, in the uh, early stage? So I, I didn't catch all of that. It sounded like the oh. question was why, yeah. why manufacturing versus other industry? Yes, why manufacturing or which industry you will 
uh, you will put the uh, you were in the first priority. Yes. So we, we chose manufacturing because we have a very strong uh, network within the manufacturing space. And uh, we, we are the most keenly aware of, of you know, the people who feel the pain point within the manufacturing space. Uh, however, this technology is broadly applicable and we've been exploring other industries as well uh, within the industrial space like warehousing and logistics. Um, and so, uh, but, but we think manufacturing is, is the appropriate beachhead. Okay. okay, got you. Thank you. And and we, we um, I I noticed this that you you use the uh, the CV technology to to capture the uh, status and and uh, uh, of the workers, and there are a lot of methods. Yes, like a uh, uh, a lot of uh, safety issues. And so how um, how do you build your uh, you build your data uh, database uh, for for uh, for the supervision? Uh, Salim, do you want to take that? Yep. Um, could you could you repeat the question, please? Yes, yes. Uh, I know. Uh, uh, my question is that you uh, you have to build a database um, for uh, for all the actions for all the different kinds of safety issues uh, you you have to detect it. So so how yeah. do you how how do you build the database? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for reiterating that. Um. So. Uh, we, we have a kind of a novel approach that um, mm -hmm. breaks down all actions into sub actions. And this is kind of taken from an existing method in, in manufacturing. Um, and so, you know, like being able to assemble more complex actions from simpler actions like carrying, pouring, and raising is, is the approach that we take. Um, and so, you know, we train on these more primitive actions and that allows a new task be defined in terms of these. And so, yeah, we've been assembling some databases from some of the testing that we've been doing. As we continue testing, we'll have more robust and complete primitive yeah. actions. And I, I think at the at the heart of that question is, is scalability, right? How, how do we build out each of these individual tasks to enable kind of a, a complete solution within a manufacturing setting? And why we can succeed in doing this, uh, on this slide we show, how uh, our approach offers same accuracy as state of the art, however, uh, over half a reduction in training time. So that's really how we win from a st scalability standpoint that uh, we can train these new use cases much faster. Gotcha, thank you. There's a question in the audience. Before I take that, I want to make sure uh, any of the judges have a chance to uh, ask their questions. Okay. Uh, I still agree by doing this in cybersecurity. Because I can't um, all the work by Yeah, uh, cybersecurity always a good question. Um, <clears throat> that you know, certainly at the heart of the way that we build this out, uh, we would need to bring on professionals as we build out the team. Right now, it's just the three of us. Um, but I will say that the the, the good news there is, uh, at least for our initial product, there is no. Um, immediate feedback back to any machinery or any robotics that could cause harm to someone. So this that would just kind of create a dark spot in the analytics for the, uh, for the facility. 
All right, thank you very much, Tristar. Yeah, I think that's time. Uh, thank you very much. Round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Rarelink, which is uh, joining us on Zoom. Hi there. I, am I going to share my screen or you have my slides? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Let me know if you see it. Yeah, we're good. Okay, all right. Hi everyone, my name is Kai Tai. Um, sorry for not being in Boston. Um, currently HBS first year students, uh, we are in the emergent field program, so calling from Tennessee. Um, so my project is RareLink, uh, which aims to creating dynamic NFT. Uh, before we dive in into that project, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So NFT is the unit uh, representing the underlying digital assets that is the smallest unit used in the metaverse. So uh, let's kick it off. So how big is this potential market? Um, so we've seen so far that the metaverse market started around 64 billion USD in 2021, ev uh, evolving, evolving exponentially until the projected 2.1 uh, trillion in 2030. But other bigger banks and institutions have other better uh, projections. So, for example, Citibank projecting anything between eight to thirteen trillion, uh, whereas Morgan Stanley is on the eight trillion side. So, we wanted to take a small chunk of that market and let's see what is the current challenges. All right, um, most of most of you know the NFT as a profile picture. Um, Profile picture and nowadays the challenge is liquidity is very low. Uh, and if you want any owners of NFT to make profit, then the latter has to sell it on the secondary market, depriving the, the latter of potential upside. Uh, the other solution that exists currently is licensing the NFT, but that presents a lot of risk. So what we're trying to do now is offer a platform that will split the ownership and the right to use of that NFT. And I will, think, I will say the add value of our platform is enabling the off-chain information to be added on-chain on the NFT. Uh, so on the next page, we have that diagram. So I'm going to move from the left side to the right side to explain how that platform works. Hi, Hi, right. Actually, I think our, um, on our screen, your slides are not moving. So if you want to reshare, maybe. Sure. Okay, which okay, one? There we go. Okay, cool. Yep. All right. So uh, this is the, uh, the representation of our platform. I'm starting from the left side to the right side. Uh, so uh, on the left side, you have the current NFT, which could be a profile picture, a metaverse, real estate, or a music NFT. Currently, both the right to use and the ownership are embedded in the single NFT, in a single token. So then we move on our platform. Uh, as I mentioned before, RareLink is the platform that will enable off-chain information to move on-chain. So those information related, for example, to a music NFT could be the number of time this music NFT could be displayed, uh, the uh, period for, of which it could be available to fans, etc. Then uh, once the user stake that NFT on our platform and uh, the, the data would be implemented, we'll split that NFT into the two different ones on, that you see on the right side. So a right to use NFT and the ownership NFT. And the added value of that platform is instead of renting or selling uh, the NFT as a whole, the, ownership, the owner of that NFT can just sell or rent the right to use NFT while the ownership NFT is sent back to the owner's portfolio or the owner's MetaMask. Um, and finally, I would say, because you added off-chain information on-chain, uh, the NFT could have a set lifetime cycle. For example, 
number of time of usage or certain time, let's say one week or two. And once it's achieved that parameter, then the NFT will be self-destroyed. Um, can you see it? Is it moving the slides? Yes. Okay, cool. So uh, a word on the business model. So we targeted three different uh, customer groups, first being our major priority institutions. Uh, then we have key opinion leaders, could be artists, could be project founders, and finally the, the retail investors. And how we're going to, to earn money. Uh, so the business model is very similar of that you can see currently on the market. So we're taking a certain percentage for service fee minting, and depending on all the art services we will offer, then we'll take 0.5% of Oracle services, cross-chain minting, or staking on our platform. In terms of projections, uh, so before I jump into the numbers, I'd like to present some assumptions. Um, so the following numbers have been calculated using a top-down approach based on the transaction volumes. Um, we did not include the advertisement revenue that could be substantial once the platform is live. Uh, EBITDA margins has been set to 80%, which is taken from comms currently. And finally, if um, you are interested in the valuation, then we can have a equity value based on the EBITDA multiple of 20X already taken, uh, also taken from comps in software companies um, in the Web2 space. So uh, we plan to launch it um, as two of this year. Uh, having those assumptions, we aiming for a 1.2 million revenue this year until a 30 million uh, in 2025. So here is our roadmap. Uh, the roadmap are divided, is divided into three different phases. For the first phase, um, it's like the pilot phase for us. So we are launching not only the platform, but also uh, all the security behind it. So all the uh, backbone of that platform will be implemented and it will enable retail investors try to stake, mint those two different NFTs and try to see how the market is responding to our uh, solution. Then uh, in phase two, um, as I mentioned, our priority would be on institutions or big firms. So we'll deploy uh, software tool and API interfaces so that those big firms can build on our existing solution and tailor made their own solutions on the platform. And finally, for the last part, uh, we're, we're trying to onboard more application on the platform uh, which aims uh, to achieve that commitment in phase three, uh, Q4 of 2023. Um, then finally, uh, to give a word about the core team. Uh, so I'm the CEO and co-founder. The, um, the product development is backed by uh, four different people with extensive work experience in developing. Uh, we have back-end and front-end engineers. And finally, we have Alice uh, leading, uh, leading our marketing, marketing efforts to promote the, the solution. Thank you all. Uh, happy to answer any questions you have. Hello. Yep. Hi. Uh, thank you for the introduction of your project. Uh, I have a question about your revenue model. Yep. So I think you showed a uh, showing a slides that you get a charge a, a certain percentage of fees for different uh, platforms. I'm yep. just wondering how did you come up with these numbers? Uh, on the the percentage of the fees, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So those are based on the current uh, business model from those big NFT marketplaces. 2.5% is uh, the fees applied on Rarible, on OpenSea, or LooksRare. So we're taking as a benchmark the same fees as currently available. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so I've seen a couple of uh, teams doing this uh, regenerative uh, NFT projects. So can you tell us more about what differentiate uh, your team and what do you think is the success factor of this project? Sure. 
uh, I would say we have two competitive advantages. First is on the meeting side that is cross chain. And second is the chain link Oracle that add off chain information on chain. So let me elaborate on the first one. So um, currently the NFTs is siloed into the blockchain world. It could be on Ethereum, Solana, but not communication between those different blockchains. But because we have that platform that will mint new NFTs, uh, we, can, uh, we allow any users to choose where the NFT would be minted. Let's say you have a NFT on Ethereum, then you want it to change on, um, for example, on Solana. Then you'll mint your right to use NFT on Solana instead of staying in Ethereum. Uh, on the second part, which is off-chain information enabled. Uh, so that, that is the added value. And I would say uh, there's few uh, projects that currently implemented that solution because it's quite complex from a tech perspective. Um, so in allowing people to have their hand on NFT and to decide the life cycle of this newly minted NFT is crucial from a security and personal ma asset management perspective. So that is why the, for those two reasons, we think we have certain advance compared to our competitors. Thanks very much. Sure. Hi, hi can you talk more about the uh, technical side? Uh, uh, especially I'm wondering, um, is the uh, right to use the NFT is, uh, um, is on chain or, or not on chain? I, I mentioned that you, you like to use the Oracle services. Yeah. So it, it is, it is the, not on chain database and, and how to make sure the, uh, the, the data is on chain and, and, and the users can protect their uh, uh, assets. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I understood uh, at the beginning. So all the information yep. would be on chain. Okay. Yep. All information is on chain. Yes. Okay. yes. And we will rely on decentralized storage uh, provided by all the projects. Um, we, you, you know, the current competitors in the market, uh, but we will relay on those projects to store our data. And what kind of, uh, um, uh, which sector of uh, NFT you will you would like to employ, the, uh, deploy the, your uh, uh, technology first, like uh, the all the, the pictures or the music or the videos or, or something like that? Yeah. So we have tractions in three different verticals. Uh, I would say the biggest one is with record labels companies, so music side. Then we have the real estate on metaverse. And finally, we have the GameFi, you know, all the attributes are now minted on NFT. Mm -hmm. So that is why yeah. those three different verticals are the main uh, attraction we have so far. If you want me to elaborate on any of those, um, feel free. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for a link. I think that's time. Uh, round of applause, thank you. All right, next up we have X Story, who is also joining us online. Can you hear me? Yes. Sounds good. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Roger Diaz and I'm the co-founder of X Story. At XStory, our mission is to revolutionize the way humans learn and perform clinical tasks. We use extended reality and interactive storytelling to create immersive and personalized learning experience that improve the performance of healthcare professionals. Healthcare is the largest and fastest growing industry in the United States. Consequently, we have a huge demand for effective medical training solutions. Accelerated by the pandemic, all institutions around the world moved to online learning, but using tools that were created by design for online meetings, not for learning. For decades, science has proven that clinicians, physicians, nurses don't learn through lectures and reading materials. However, we continue providing the same type of experience for these professionals. Uh, now, only through a different type of media, for example, through Zoom, but still it's the same ineffective type of methodology. Medical simulation, it's a great tool for experiential learning and for hands-on training. However, 
uh, simulation centers require huge buildings. Often, these buildings are very expensive uh, constructions in very expensive locations, for example, close to hospitals. And even some simulation centers use hospital spaces, what is very, very expensive. It also requires, in all these physical simulation centers, very expensive simulators to simulate humans and simulate medical equipments, and also has a very, very high operational cost to maintain and to run these in-person simulation activities. And the reality is really that most community hospitals and clinics, for example, in the United States and more even around the world, do not have access to these state-of-the-art simulation centers. And even those institutions that have a simulation center, they are really struggling to maintain the high operational cost and to justify the return on investment. So it's a real, real issue uh, and a high costy uh, solution to provide medical training. When we think about the medical education market, we talk about a huge, huge global market, and simulation is an important part of that market. Only in the United States, for example, this is the map of all the simulation centers that are accredited by the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. And it's estimated that this is only half. It's estimated that we have more than 1,200 simulation centers in the West alone. And as I said, most healthcare professionals still don't have access to these fancy centers and buildings, creating a substantial importance to press demand for uh, effective medical learning. And who cares about this problem, right? First, the learners. Of course, the learners are in the center of all this problem. Uh, they demand a lot of effective uh, training solutions. However, the learners are the end users they usually don't make the buying decision. The same for the instructors, the teachers, and the curriculum designers. Usually they are users of educational technologies. But when we, we, we try to understand the, the ecosystem and the buying ecosystem of, of technology solutions for education, they are end users. They influence, they influence the decision making, the, the payments, but they are not the, the actual payers. So through customer discovery, our team and X-Story did more than 130 interviews to understand the, the ecosystem in, in, in this area. And we found that these are the real decision makers and payers of training solutions. First, universities and hospitals, right? They have a huge demand for effective training solutions. They are not happy at all with the current solution, especially over the pandemic, trying to do medical training through Zoom and other type of video conference solutions. However, hospitals and universities have a high resistance to change and are not willing to pay. What we learn also through our customer discovery uh, interviews is that this specific sector, medical device, pharma, and biotech companies, in addition to have a huge demand for training solutions, they have a blank check. And that's what we heard from many VPs of education training in these companies, they have a blank check for effective training solutions because for these companies, medical device, biotech, pharma, the quality of the training, as better is the training, better is the sales. So training for these companies is, the, is part of their core mission and is directly related to increasing sales of their medical device and pharma company. And that's the reason why at X-Story, we're focused now at this first stage on this customer segment. This is our team. We have a complementary expertise, including medicine, education, computer science, extended reality development and storytelling. And we have composed this great team to really uh, tackle this problem related to medical education. We were incubated and accelerated by the Harvard Innovation Lab, by the MIT Regional I-Corps program, and also by the National Science Foundation I-Corps, in which we just finished a customer discovery program. We are a spin-off of the Mass General Brigham, who that is the, the network of hospitals affiliated to the Harvard Medical School and the Harvard Medical School. And we were inspired by our previous research on XR training development for NASA and the part of defense. Actually, this is how our team uh, uh, started putting together uh, the, the, the X story team and decided to move forward with this startup. And here are a few uh, examples 
of the previous work we developed in this area of extended reality uh, using volumetric video for creating highly realistic, as you can see here, and immersive training solutions that can be deployed in any type of device, virtual reality headsets, augmented reality tablets, and even in desktops. Our solution uh, is web-based, is a web-based XR platform that streams XR content through the web without the need for users to have high processing computers. On a simple browser, learners can experience our X stories in whatever device they already have. And when we think here about the competitive landscape of extended reality medical education, right? There are like a huge amount of companies. Last time we counted it was like more than 250 companies only in the West developing XR solutions for medical education. However, 95% of these companies, they are device specific. They create solutions only for HoloLens, only for Quest 2, only for this device. And this is a huge differential of XChority is that by developing in WebXR, we can deploy our solutions for whatever device the user has. And that's the reality. The reality that most learners they don't have a headset, a VR headset at home, right? That, that they will come in a few years. But right now we can develop, for example, immersive and engaging training in web browser in a desktop. That's very important for us. We create an extraordinary, highly realistic virtual humans with facial expression and motion capture from real people. That gives a really a real sense of presence and realism to our X stories. We also uh, create engaging storytelling and real time interactivity that enable the user to make decisions on these X stories, to see the consequence of those decisions. When we talk here about medical decisions, for example, and really choose their own adventure. We also promote training and retention of relevant skills that improve learning experience, but also increase performance in their workplace. Key to our solution at XStory is immediate feedback, and that we learn from our uh, users and customers during customer discovery, that feedback is important, and we build feedback engine in our platform that's able to provide specific and personalized feedback to learners about their performance. And also we use learner analytics in the way that our training is data-driven. For medical companies, that's one of the cases that we are working right now, our platform will also integrate with their CRM softwares, their customer resource managers like Salesforce, in a way that managers and business directors can evaluate the real impact of our training on the employee's performance. To finalize, just our roadmap. So we start with customer discovery prototype. We are here with our MVP that's going to be launched in June. Uh, and our goal is to have a pilot in the next six months with one or two medical device companies. And then for scalability, that's very important. We are creating the XStory creator that will empower and allow creators to create their own XStories, their own training solutions. And in the future, we're going to create our XStory metaverse as a marketplace in the way that creators can not only create the XStories they're training, but also can monetize and make money uh, based on their content and their creations. So thank you very much for your attention. Hello. Hi. Thank you very thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, I have a question about your uh, product. Uh, so do you think your product can replace the simulation center entirely? That's a, that's a great question. I, th I think that not yet. Uh, I, I would say that in the next uh, three years, we can replace half of what we do in the simulation center. Uh, one of the challenges we have is with haptics, right? It's how to creates tactile sensations for surgical activities. But in the XR, the tactile gloves are already being developed. So I would say the next like three, four years, I would say half, half 50% of what we do in the simulation center can be replaced. In 10 years, I would say that almost 100%, very uh, uh, secure to say that. I see. So, uh, sorry, another question is, uh, so what upgrade, upgradation you did 
uh, for your prototype from, um, how to say, so you have your prototype for uh, medical sales uh, already done, right? Uh, and next step, you wanted to test in the medical device industry. So what upgrade did you do for this step? Yeah, so for, for this step, what we're working now, we created a, a very like low fidelity prototype. We're now uh, working on the motion capture side that we can create, for example, not one x but 10, 20 of them in the, at scale. And what we're working right now, and, and really, really also looking like for, for funding, is to create like a motion capture studio that we can capture the, the motion and create these realistic avatars in, in a more a scalable way. I see. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from the audience. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. Thank you so much for your presentation. One quick question is, um, we, we know there is already existing online tools for uh, learning experience and um, uh, how could you evaluate the effectiveness of your tool compared to others that has already been in place? And um, what is the advantage uh, or how to prove the effectiveness? Yeah, thank you, th thank you very much for your question. And that's really uh, one of the, the advantage of like leveraging our partnership with the university because in our lab at Harvard Medical School Sim Center, we do studies really to compare different modalities, right? So we are, we are doing a study right now, for example, that we're comparing the effectiveness of like the learning outcomes of using VR in a computer, in an immersive VR headset or in a tablet, right? Because sometimes uh, uh, we just assume that there is some difference between them. So I would say that the way to do that is really through research and partnership with academia uh, to really show with data uh, which tool and which modality is better. And that's something that we really leverage with uh, this partnership between uh, our company coming uh, as a spin-off from the university. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Round of applause. Thank you, X story. Okay, next up we have our next team, Basis AI or Basis, sorry, um, hope I didn't butcher it, um, who are also presenting online. Hey, we're Basis.ai. Let us um, share our screen. Um, can you guys see the screen? Yeah. Awesome. Hi, we are Basis.ai. And we combined have 17 years of experience in data science, machine learning, and entrepreneurship. Um, these are our profiles. And before we jump into the problem, our vision is to make living with type 2 diabetes like living without it. And here are a few of our attractions. We have already secured 125K investment from Norkin Impact Accelerator. We have also received USD 100K angel investment commitments. We have been the founders and the winning team of MIT 100K Accelerate program and the semi-finalists for President's Innovation Challenge. And finally, we have been partnering with the leading diabetes clinic of the world, which is Jocelyn Diabetes Center. And we have filed the patent on identifying diabetic progression of using artificial intelligence. So before we jump into the problem, uh, we would like to share a per personal story. My dad had unmanaged diabetes for 25 years. And it was a very uh, like it was a very hard problem for my dad to solve, even though he he was very educated. And it was problem it was a problem for his family as well. And this is not just a story; it is a story of five hundred million people. And the problem has great uh, numbers associated with it, which includes almost hundred billion dollars loss in revenue for employers, and it also amounts to three thousand dollars loss per patient per year for. Peers and MCOs. 
let's jump into the solution. So our solution is a digital health app to help manage metabolic health, including diabetes. Now, there are a lot of details on the slide, but the key point is that we're addressing this using ecosystem as a service. In this ecosystem, we have AI, we have behavioral psychology, digital avatar, and precision nutrition. The most important element is AI, which will be discussed in the next slide. Where we are now in deriving this AI-powered metabolic health solution? Well, we have already filed our patent to predict whether patients require clinical interventions and to predict the type of diagnostic checks that they need to have. This is already done. And what's going on right now is that we, have, we are having clinical validation through our partnership with Jocelyn Diabetes Center. And our next approach is to validate our tech through the employers, which we have to show two things. One is it reduces the cost, and second is it increases the healthcare outcome of their employees. For the patient app, um, people can track their biomarkers using the app and receive behavioral nudges through it. They will have access to um, a digital avatar in the app, which will help them uh, indicate progression and provide motivations and companionship. Now, avatar is a big topic, which we may not have time to cover. So if you have questions, ask me. Of course, to complete the product, we also have an employer platform to keep track of employees' performance in terms of health outcomes, in terms of the cost reduced for healthcare expenditure. And here are a few screens uh, for our MVP. Regarding business model, we are doing a B2B to C model in the sense that we sell to employers and payers and our end users will be employees who are diabetic or pre-diabetic. It'll be on a monthly subscription basis with different plans. That leads to the market size. Um, I mean, so adult diabetes cost for the US market is huge. Uh, nobody, questioned, nobody questioned that and it's growing. Um, even if we only count the digital diabetes market, it is already $37 billion. And we will project our revenue, annual revenue by uh, 2027 to be $100 million. And that can be achieved even if we only capture 0.27% of the market. Now, here comes the most important thing of the presentation. How are we different? What is our secret sauce? There are three key points. Number one is our partnership with Jocelyn Diabetes Center, which is a leading institute. Um, this allows us to access the best curated patient records um, for diabetes in the world. And we are also having partnerships with hospitals in Asia, which allows us to have a very diverse data set to train our algorithm on. And the second point is we have already filed our AI patent. Uh, we are on the route to file our second patent along with the partnership with Jocelyn. Third point is that we're launching the digital health avatar for diabetes, which is pretty unique. Nobody here is doing it, especially for diabetes. Here is just a more metric style um, marking for our competitive advantages. As I said, we do have access to pretty good data. We have filed our AI patent and we do CGM plus nutrition, CGM meaning continuous glucose monitor. And moving on to the ask, we are asking for a seed investment of $1.9 million, and we plan to close the seed round by May end. And we are also seeking potential customers um, and, and collaborators, introduction to those. Moving on, here are a few next steps. We are conducting pilots with some of the large employers in the US, and we would be tracking key success metrics for it. And the next uh, point would be to have these pilots converted into paying customers. We will be filing the second patent, like Jay mentioned, and we plan to close our seed round by May end. We are also building our R&D team and software team. Finally, who are with us for in, in, in this journey? We have data scientists, researchers, designers, and epidemiologists from Harvard. And we also have in, um, interns from India. And finally, we have advisors who are some of the key opinion leaders in healthcare and AI. So that's it from us. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you guys for the presentation. I think you skipped yourselves. Can you uh, both also introduce yourselves for us a little bit? Sure. Um, so oh. can you guys see? Yeah. 
Sure. Okay. So I'm Amber. I have 10 years of experience in data science, including a successful company exit. I hold three patents and more than five research in AI and data science. I have also instructed collaborative data science in healthcare at MIT for one semester. So I am G. Before coming to Harvard, I spent eight years in healthcare. Um, I used to manage the pharma business of PF Harbor in five countries in Europe and Asia. Um, I do have expertise in health data science. I was a presenter at Women Data Science Conference and also worked in the AI and DS functions in Dana Farber Cancer Institute and MGH. Cool, thanks. So, and you guys are doing this in the States, right? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so I, I saw from the audience that they were asking why is your strategy going towards the employers versus the uh, payors? I, I don't know yeah. what that means, but I guess it's just the customers. Yeah, so one big reason for it is payers usually have a very long sales cycle, um, somewhere between six months to one year. And since we already have data from our partnership with Jocelyn Diabetes Center and various institutes in Asia, including India, China, and Singapore, we are almost ready with our employer strategy. For instance, the kind of results we are see, see, seeing from Justin Diabetes Center, they translate into $2,000 savings for employers. So it's much easier sell for employers as of now, but once we are done with the employer strategy, investors or peers would be, sorry, uh, peers would be the best uh, prospect maybe after one year, one and a half years, once we have proven our employer strategy. Well, but thanks, thanks for asking this question. That, that's a great question. And, and peers are definitely on our mind because uh, they, they are the most uh, paying capacity players. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, I have two questions. So uh, first, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what kind of data uh, do you use to feed your AI algorithm and do the prediction? Sure. So the kind of data we have. Yeah. Please Sorry. Go ahead. Um, the kind of data we have includes multimodal data, which means the data related with uh, glucose levels of patients. And this data is uh, longitudinal. Then we have information about the electronic medical records for our patients, including diabetic ne nephropathy, neuropathy, retinopathy. So anything related to diabetes, even if it is something which is evolving out of diabetes, for instance, um, CVDs, uh, cardiovascular diseases, or even kidney diseases, which is nephropathy. We have all those sort of data in our electronic medical records. I see. Uh, and I, I'm also wondering, are you the... Uh, are you the first platform that collaborating with Jocelyn? Um, I think among the competitors that we list on our slides, which are pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty big bills, we, I believe in our record, it is, uh, we are the first to collaborate uh, with Jocelyn. Yeah. In fact, we are the first ones to get revenue out of Jocelyn. Usually people have to pay to conduct certain clinical trials. Um, for us, it's the opposite. They are paying us to develop these algorithms, which are because, primarily because of two reasons. One of our advisors has been connected with Jocelyn Diabetes Center and they, they make the introduction. Second, our combined experience, Jay and I have more than 17 years of experience in machine learning and data science. And we had already filed a patent when we started our discussions with them. So probably they realized whatever we were doing is directly relevant, with, relevant for them. I see. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, judges. It seems like we have a question from the online chat, which is what are your go to market strategies for employers versus payers? Right. Our go to market strategy for employers would be um, we are starting with employers who, number one, have good cash, number two, have good incentive to keep their employees healthy. So such companies, a typical profile would be a mid-sized tech company or a consulting company because because of the type of lifestyle that these employees have, they're actually more prone to poor metabolic health 
and these companies um, have good revenues and they are pretty motivated um, to keep people healthy. And this is something that we have derived from our employee, in, uh, in, sorry, employer interviews and our customer research. So these are the companies that we will go right after. Um, second type of companies would be self-insured employers. They do have, I mean, our interests will be very much aligned. You know, everybody wants to reduce the healthcare costs. But payers, that's another story. Based on what Amur has said, I mean, usually selling to payers have a much longer cycle and they would love to see results from the actual employers and they'll be more motivated to test it out among you know, their member organizations. So that will be one step forward. Yeah, and we have, by the way, two pilots secured with employers. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that's time. Um, all right, and that concludes all of the pitches and Q&As. Um, so what's going to happen now is, um, so we're going to let the judges exit the webinar to um, deliberate, discuss um, the teams that have presented. And uh, in the meantime, for those that are still in person, we're going to hand out the gifts that we promised. Uh, so those that would take five minutes. Uh, there are judges, you can now follow the instructions on your uh, Zoom chat to the other meeting link. And then in five minutes, please come back and then we will resume the closing speeches by two of our fellow judges. Um, all right, um, for the online audience, feel free to take a break, um, five minutes, and we'll be back with the, key, uh, the closing keynotes and then followed by the uh, results announcement. Thank you so much. And for in-person audiences, we're gonna come around uh, for the gifts.
Okay. Okay, thank you for your patience. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so the judges have our results, uh, but we're not just gonna reveal them just yet. Uh, before that, we have two closing keynotes from two of our fellow judges. First up, we have Shuo Huang, uh, who, we, as we introduced earlier, uh, graduated postdoc from Harvard University and is now part of Baidu Ventures uh, in charge of biotech in the, US, uh, the North American area. Um, so without further ado, I'll give it back to uh, Shuo Huang. All right, uh, should I share my screen? Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Wait a second. Oh. Wait a second. No worries. Mm -hmm. I just realized I've blocked. Mm -hmm. going on here. Mm. Oh, no. Oh, all right. Oh, sorry, I probably have to leave the Okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, we can start with Tina, if that's okay, and you can work on the um, screen share in the meantime. Sure, I, I think she just uh, locked out, I think because she need, probably needs to uh, uh, share her file. So should I start? Yeah, yeah, Tina, please go. Thank you. Okay, sure, yeah. Well, actually I don't have a deck, but thank you guys very much for your time. And I know it's really late in Boston and I will keep my uh, conversation really short. So I've seen so many uh, familiar faces, both in the presenters and the audiences. And thanks for the committee members and your many late nighters that made uh, this pitch competition possible. Also, I hope all the audiences had a wonderful time and learned something new and exciting in this pitch competition. And I hope this event encourages all of you to learn something more beyond what you learned today. Thanks for all the awesome presentations and I, you will know the results just shortly. I truly hope that you go beyond this competition and decide to take a lifelong journey in entrepreneurship. Today, we also have very, a group of very awesome judges and I hope each one of the teams have impressed the judges and this competition will lead you guys to some one-on-one -on -one sessions with all the judges. So during, the, and during and after World War II, Boston became the heart of industrial complex. The whole country's economic development was accelerated by financing technologies from scientific labs in Boston. History made this city the center of the most advanced technology innovation and talents in the world. Today, in the middle of the global pandemic, we've seen great companies like Moderna founded in Cambridge 10 years ago, provided us with timely and effective vaccines. As for GenFound, when Bob and Victor, the two co-founders of Duarento, founded GenFound 11 years ago, the idea was and always will be backing young, talented, and courageous overseas students like you guys with business ambitions to compete worldwide. We believe in the power of capital to liberate human talent and to sharpen incentives. Quoting from my recent favorite author, Sebastian Malaby, by freeing talent to convert ideas into products 
and by marrying unconventional experiments with hard commercial targets, entrepreneurs make history with the help of uh, venture capitalists. As you may notice, the, this past first quarter of the year has been hard for startups. With regional military conflict, conflicts and energy crisis, US inflation has reached to unbelievably high of 7%. And along with the Omicron outbreaks, tighter travel restriction and the plunge of the global stock market, everything just seems way too bizarre. Many of you may wonder if now is a good time to start a new company. It has been proven in history that many great companies were actually founded during hard times because hard times inspire us to be more innovative and to be more disruptive. Even if we just look for the past 15 years, Many of the today's great public companies were founded either during or after the recession. Airbnb was founded in 2008, right in the middle of the recession, and Uber was founded in 2009, and so on. So we should always be hopeful to a brighter future. As angel investors, we are backing the right team leading the next generation of innovation. We look for founders with passion, determination, and imagination. School is where you find your team and your lifetime, lifetime partners and friendship. So please take advantage of your time on campus, talking to as many inspiring new people as you can, making meaningful connections, get involved in cool projects. Just start from today. Do what you love and create something that matters in your life. So that's all I can say for today's speech. Thank you all for your time and have a great night. Thank you very much, Tina. Sure, are you back with us? I think so. So yeah, I was restricted to share screen and I don't know why, let me try it again. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so yeah. Yongchen called me out. <laughs> so, all right, uh, so it's, it's not me sharing screen because uh, I still have some problems with that. So, so, so my colleague just helped me. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Shua, uh, I'm from Baidu Venture. So today it's great to see you guys having a chance to socialize in person. I I actually, I work in the Longwood area for almost four years, and it has been almost a year since I left Boston. Uh, I feel like I have missed the city, especially when summer comes. Uh, so today, uh, I'd like to thank the HMS uh, committee for the invitation and the introduction. And it's a great honor and pleasure to be here and to represent by the venture. Um, and first, I wanted to congratulate all the finalists and thank you all for making such fantastic pitches. Uh, I'm so inspired to uh, inspired by all of you as entrepreneurs with deep knowledge of uh, future tech. I so as I mentioned, I was also an ex Harvard researcher before diving to venture capital. So today, I uh, as an investor coming from lab. I would like to share with you some perspectives about running a startup as a technical expert and how Biden Venture will support you. So yeah, so, so this is first slide that I wanted to emphasize today is the emerging technology as highlighted in this uh, tech cloud. So many years ago, we might consider that those technologies were far from our daily lives. But when people see this, the pictures showed on the right side that uh, all these tech unicorns showed in this picture, they may realize that all oh, the future has arrived all of a sudden. But as entrepreneurs and investors, we all know success is not coming from nowhere. So a solid technology doesn't imply a terrific product. A terrific product doesn't uh, signify a excellent business model. 
or an excellent business model doesn't represent positive cash flow. So translating technologies into business is hard. And that's why we are here to help. So next slide. So we all know this uh, the venture capital funnel that only tiny portion of seeded startups were able to exist through IPOs or uh, M&A. Nobody is born to do business. As tech people, most of the time you start your business uh, based on your maybe common sense or the keywords you learn from business workshops or other people's uh, experience. If you're lucky, you may find a partner with extensive business experience or a like serial entrepreneurs, but still you need support. Like, uh, like you need financial aid, of course, or you need advice to make uh, progress or expand your business. Or when you're in, when you encounter difficulties, you you need someone to stand by your side and encourage you, and all of this will help you achieve your goals. And who will be your best supporter? That should be someone who understands your tech, and who values your tech, who knows how to translate your tech, and most importantly, who understand you. I understand your traits, your skills, your uh, aspirations, your motivations, and your potential. Next slide. Yeah. So here I wanted to introduce our value to you. So Baidu Venture is a independent VC initiated by Baidu. So I, I assume most of you know Baidu, right? So the internet and AI giant in China. So apparently we inherit Baidu's gene and uh, are fascinated about uh, cutting edge technologies. We believe many underlying technologies have great potential to achieve in the business market and will eventually change people's daily lives. Like the background picture showing here is from our website, yeah. And this changes will catalyze the birth of more tax and form a feedback loop. So what we are doing now are giving them money, of course, and help them thriving and waiting them to grow and letting them change the world. So next slide. Yeah, our picture. And uh, so today, so now it's 2022. Yeah, in 2022, the tech industry is expected to boom more than ever, opening many doors to new people, um, new to new people that wanted to become like tech entrepreneurs. The possibilities are endless, ranging from building an industry shaping product to by building your own SaaS platform and everything in between. When you have a dream to make this world a better place, please let us know. We are not just an investor and we're also your loyal partner. All right, so next slide. Next slide. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So here, please feel free to visit our website and send us your business plans or follow us on my chat. And thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy this talk and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you, Shaw. All right. Thank you again to all of our fellow judges and speakers. Um, it is with uh, only with their great energy and efforts and thoughts put into all the pitches that we're able to, um, you know, overgo a very successful pitch night, demo day. Um, and now comes the exciting part um, of the results announcement. Uh, let me share my screen once again to um, 
acknowledge our wonderful judges. Um, and like Shro mentioned and Tina mentioned, please reach out and you know work together to make the world a better place. Um, okay, and lastly, I'll welcome up the president for HCHC again to announce the results. Hi, thank you. So um, let's give us a last round of uh, applause for the exciting and um, inspiring presentation and conversation tonight. <laughs> and I'm honored to, uh, pre to represent um, Harvard Chi Chinese Student Club, Health Club and MIT Chief to announce the um, awards of the competition tonight. And we have three winners for the first uh, for the first prize, um, and they are up bio <laughs> and um, X story and um, three star AI. And um, oh, the award will be um, five thousand and five hundred dollars, and we will follow up with you um, on the logistic of the award process. And we also have uh, three finalist winning team. Um, and they are um, basis.ai, who I think is online. And uh, we have 3D architects. Um, and we uh, also have a rare link who is online, I think, and we will, um, and we will, the, the award is uh, $3,000. And um and we'll follow up with the logistics. Thank you so much for your participation tonight. Okay, thank you again for staying us staying with us for so late, uh, especially for those folks on the East Coast. Uh, thank you for those online. Uh, so yeah, that's a wrap for our inaugural uh, 2022 HMS Future Tech startup competition and we hope to see you again next year um yeah thank you and again thank you to our sponsors jim found um sequoia and um baidu ventures thank you so much and um yeah to our two organizing uh, committees from mit chief and uh harvard healthcare club um please uh, consider joining us if you are interested in the entrepreneur space in china and thank you Last but not least, to our organizing committee, you guys have done great. Thank you so much for pulling this together. Um, all right, thank you. Have a good night.